Uh, good morning. <laughs> Thank you for enjoying it with a six pack. The Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports at it six days a week. I'm your host, Kedrick Stumbris from um, not, not Wisconsin at, at the moment, as you might be able to tell. Uh, but you can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbris, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. Uh, if you are listening to us on your audio platform of choice, Spotify, pod, podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts. Uh, leave us a review, five stars, kind comments, helps people find the show. You can also watch us on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Scotty Six Pack. And wherever you are listening to or watching this show, you can also find my show, Snap the Pigskin. Uh, I record that weekly with a good friend of mine, Noah Clark, uh, who you may have seen on this show in the past. He's part of the radio broadcast team for iHeartRadio covering Wisconsin Badgers women's hockey team. Also, very big NFL fans. Snap the Pigskin is our weekly recap of the NFL News of the Week and we've been previewing the NFL season this week's show, which you should check out. We're going to play it here in this feed for you. Snap the pigskin. We preview the NFC North, what we think about all the teams in the NFC North, who we think is going to win the division. So, yeah, we got a good chunk of Green Bay Packers talk uh, between two Green Bay Packers fans. Also talking about the AFC North in this episode. Snap the pigskin is a ton of fun. Highly, highly recommend the listening. Look. I, I got into the NFL more in depth in the past year, frankly, because of Snap the Pigskin. Uh, I got to join this year as a permanent host, had been guesting on it in the past with Noah. Noah does an awesome job making sure that we have a great show every week for you. Uh, so tune in, listen to the rest of the show. So we break down the AFC and NFC North, talk about the NFL news, and tune in to Snap the Pigskin every week wherever you find podcasts. This podcast it's dropping in your feed on Tuesday during the season. We drop in every Wednesday. Wanted to get this episode in before roster cutdowns. Uh, but without further ado, snap the pigskin with yours truly, Kendrick Stumbrus and Noah Clark. We welcome you to another edition of Snap the Pigskin. Hello, everybody. The NFL season is right around the corner. Literally right around the corner. We can look... Right around the corner, and it's right there. We got a lot of stuff that we got to talk about. We are on the final, uh, our final division preview for this offseason before we jump into the regular season. Noah Clark, Kedrick Stumbris. Kedrick, it's good to see your face. We got the NFC North, the AFC North, and these are going to be the two, these are my two favorite divisions right now to, to preview. And even just thinking about it, it's going to be fun stuff. The AFC North with the Ravens, Browns, Steelers, Bengals, very competitive division. Then you have the NFC North. The black and blue division might be back, Kedrick. The black and blue division of the NFC North is potentially back. So I'm fired up for this episode today. This this is going to be a lot of fun. I, I think this is, we're going to be talking about four bona fide Super Bowl contenders today. Um, and a little sneak preview. I think we're going to be talking about the team that I think is going to win the Super Bowl this year. Um, and so I'm really excited. We are recording this. It is 1250 p.m. Central Time on Friday, August 23rd. By the way, you'll hear this a little bit later after the fact. So if we don't uh, mention something you think we should. That's that's too bad. We recorded this early because I'm not recording a damn podcast from the beaches of Cancun. <laughs> uh, so you He's can you can deal with it. Vacation. You can yeah you can deal with it. Uh, but I'm I'm looking forward to it. I I am really excited. I got a little bit of a surprise for you at the end of the episode, Noah. But let's let's Ooh. break down the AFC and the NFC North. Uh, I am I am fired up for this one. Uh, I, I'm very excited. Oh, dude, I am pumped for this. This is like, this is going to be very fun. I've been kind of waiting till we got to this point. So let's just jump right into it here on this gorgeous Friday that we have when you'll get this out on a Wednesday. And let's start with the Baltimore Ravens. Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens, they got so close. So, 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 so very close to the Super Bowl. And they came just a few yards short, an interception short. Lamar struggled in the in the game against the Kansas City Chiefs. And now the Ravens start back at square one. They have to compete for the division title. They have to compete with the Kansas City Chiefs. 
I I start by saying this. We got our love and hate, but I start by saying this for the love for the Baltimore Ravens. Honestly, this defense, even though they lose their entire coaching staff, almost their entire defensive staff, they still got, I think, a lot of key pieces on this defensive group. And even on the offensive side, too, you look at it with Lamar Jackson still being there. You also add Derrick Henry. That's a good boost for this team. I think that's that's a very positive thing for the Baltimore Ravens and just overall for this team to get back to where they were at last year. Uh, now, the hate part about this is their depth at running back kind of sucks. And, mm-hmm. and even – and I was going to put – the Ravens losing their almost their entire defensive coaching staff on there. But I, I think the running back room is going to hurt a lot more because you don't have Gus Edwards. You don't have JK Dobbins. Those are your two. Those are two running backs that had very good production last year for your team and the last few years. And now they're both gone. So how are you going to replace that? Well, yeah, Derrick Henry, you could take some of that off, but they don't really have after Derrick Henry, a lot of production on this group. I mean, Justice Hill had some moments here and there where he flashed, but nothing really impressive. Keaton Mitchell, same thing. So that's kind of my love and hate for the Ravens. I talked for a long time there. <laughs> I'll let you get the floor to, to, to talk about Baltimore here. Yeah, um, I I know that it's certainly a concern with Derrick Henry's age, his usage over the last several years to to come in and, and try to buoy this Ravens running back room after after it loses Gus Edwards to the Los Angeles Chargers in the offseason. But on the other hand, you might get more out of Derrick Henry in on, on a per carry basis given that you have Lamar Jackson back there, right? In the last two seasons, he finished first in the league in in yards per rushing attempt a season ago and second in the league in yards per attempt two seasons ago, second only to Justin Fields. This is a, a great rushing attack that you have built there, along with some real weapons uh, with Mark Andrews, who I know is uh, was in a recent car crash, um, but has only a minor injury, uh, from what it sounds like from John Harbaugh and he's going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, truly like could have been just a devastating blow to, to a team like this that, because he is, he is a huge piece of, of what they do. Obviously. Uh, but I think this might be a, a little bit of a grass is greener, but actually accurate for, uh, Derek Henry in Baltimore. I think he might fit and it's almost like Derek Henry is, the change of pace back to Lamar Jackson in the rushing game, uh, where Lamar's going to be able to get you a little bit more outside and Derek Henry's. I mean, he can bounce you outside, but he can certainly plow, plow through the middle as well. But having some of that load taken off of his shoulders as he gets older, I think is good for him. And, and like you mentioned, the, you, you ha- you're going to lose some folks from that defensive staff, but I think your cornerback room might be better uh, coming into this year after this team finished first in defensive DVOA a season ago. You you lost contributors in the cornerback room, but you added, I think, better pieces to fill those role player roles. You have Nate Wiggins, who looks you know, solid unless he's playing uh, against some of these Green Bay wide receivers in the joint practice. Um, <laughs> uh, you add TJ Tampa in, in a signing as well. And I know that you lose Geno Stone and you lose him as the conference leader in interceptions, lose him in division to Cincinnati. But I think his total number of turnovers will probably regress because that's just what happens. Uh, I think overall, this is a solid secondary for, for this team. Noah, what do you hate about Baltimore heading into this year? Well, for Baltimore, like the running back core, like earlier. Oh yeah. You mentioned yeah, that. Yeah. Hi, man. Uh, <laughs> no. Yes. My I will, issue. You yeah. Know, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say one thing on that with the, with this, with the, the defense as well at it, keeping Justin Matabike back on that team, mm. giving him an extension. That's a big one too. But now well, I, I'm curious what your hate is. For- it is uh, for me. It is the offensive line cluster situation they have going on. They, they lost three starters on the offensive line coming into this season. And so you have a youth, you have some young folks getting ready to contribute. You also have a lack of depth. And then also you have 
a very unique situation with your offensive line coach. Your and your starting center, Tyler Lindenbaum, has been out of camp with a neck injury. It sounds like he's probably going to be fine, but like you have that. And then your other starting player on the offensive line that you did retain. So the two players that you did retain starting on the offensive line are a center who's been hobbled with a neck injury. And then Mm -hmm. your left tackle who Ronnie Stanley, who has been, who's 29 years old and who's 13 games played last year where the most he's played in a season since 2019. And he only played 13. You have Roger Rosengarten, who was on Washington's offensive line last year that won the Joe Moore Award for the best offensive line in college football. He's probably going to be your starting right tackle. But you also lost your offensive line coach indefinitely to a medical condition. And Joe Alessandris has been coaching offensive lines for 40 years. Now, fortunately, your interim is George Warhop, who has been coaching offensive lines in the NFL for nearly three decades. But like, man, what? what a confluence of events for this offensive line. Not to mention then your support, Mark Andrews at tight end, was in a car crash. <laughs> like, it's not looking good. Yeah, it, it's a weird, weird, weird thing for, for that front five, six uh, up there for, for Baltimore. Uh, very confusing. Yeah, they're getting also pretty old up there in age as well in that old line as well too. And and it's, it, it looking at their roster, it looks... It's just a mix of like, like different bodies. I mean, the only other player I think that I think not having Linderbaum is is pretty huge, and he's going to miss probably potentially some time going into this regular season. So, Baltimore's O line, you better hope Lamar can 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 stay on his feet as much as possible, and, yeah. and he better not be running as much because that that is one thing that while Lamar he can run and he's a very good runner of the football, you don't want him running. Uh, as much as he should, you yeah. want him back there, and especially in Todd Munkin's defense as well. And excuse me, offense, Todd Munkin's offense as well, and how fl- and how fluid they are throwing the ball. So certainly, certainly. Uh, let's move on to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Then uh, out in the Steel City, they they have to replace a few defensive backs uh, on that team. Um, and, but ultimately what I love is you still got TJ Watt, no matter how rough your uh, defense might, might be, um, you are bringing in Deshaun Elliott, who is a career free safety to play strong safety for you. You're bringing in Cam Sutton, who is going to face an eight game suspension after he pled, uh, guilty to misdemeanor domestic battery. Uh, but you get coverage and pass rush from TJ Watt. So like, that's really great. Um, I, I don't really know what they're going to do at the, the third level of that defense behind the linebackers, but yeah. Um, no, no. What, what do you, what do you love and hate about the Pittsburgh Steelers this season? Uh, so with Pittsburgh, I mean, they did beef up the defense. I think that's the only positive thing that I will say about the Steelers because I mean because when you look at it they they TJ Watt with you said it with TJ Watt still being there you your defense you know your team is still pretty dang good on the defensive side of the ball and you also still I think you also got to give props to Cameron Hayward too with Cameron Hayward on the defensive Mm -hmm. side of the ball too you you still have two you have an inside pass rusher and an outside pass rusher that really helps uh also I think we also have to uh, we also have to remember too they got Patrick Queen this off season, mm-hmm. which is, which that's a big, that's a big fill for their, for their inside linebacking core right now. Uh, the depth at that spot was pretty bad and they needed to kind of fill that spot with maybe like someone who was serviceable. They got the best inside linebacker. I think they could have gotten the free agent market in Patrick queen. So that's a big boost. Uh, other than that, this offense, I, I, I just, man, they are, they, they just look rough. They just look so rough this year. Even, even when, even despite the fact bringing in Arthur Smith, this offense for Pittsburgh just looks, just looks so bad. I mean, everybody wants to say, you know, in Pittsburgh, yeah, you got Justin Fields. Yeah. You got Russell Wilson. You got two quarterbacks that maybe will give your team a boost. But I also will say too, you got Justin Fields and you got Russell Wilson and Neither one of those guys I could see being a serviceable quarterback 
for this Pittsburgh Steelers team for the entire season. I mean, it, it, we've already known what Russell Wilson is. And, and I think, too, Russell Wilson might be washed. And th- yeah. this is a very big possibility. Russell Wilson might be washed. And then there's the also possibility that Justin Fields might be a bust. So that it, it what does, it doesn't what? look it doesn't look good. I know, and, and you and you <laughs> and, and and it doesn't if look only good. Only any of us were screaming this from the mountaintops for two years. I know. <laughs> uh, me being the Justin Fields truther can admit that now that he is in fact a bust, but. Uh, yeah, they just don't have anything in the quarterback position. The running back core, you got Najee. I mean, Najee was really, he was at some points just really slow. And Jalen Warren should have been the starting back for the Steelers team Mm. from the get-go. And he wasn't. And then the wide receiving core, you have George Pickens. You've got Van Jefferson and Pat Fryermuth as your tight end. But... They really just, I just, yeah. Even looking at your face after after that facial expression, that just goes to show yeah. how brutal this Steelers offense looks. And I just, I just think they're going to struggle this year. I, I think this is going to be an offense that's going to be in the bottom twenties of the league this year. I think that is not an absurd prediction. Yeah. Not, not even close. I mean, I mean, look, the fact that we are having to have a genuine quarterback competition conversation about Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. I think it tells you literally all, all, all you need to know. Um, You want to talk about hate watching the Denver Broncos. Yeah, for real. Like, Like, uh, come on. Yeah. Justin Fields, I mean, has not learned a lesson about playing quarterback in the national football league since, since he joined it. Russell Wilson, seems to think he has learned everything and that led to his downfall in Denver. But yeah, this is not going to be much of anything. Uh, should, shall we move on to the Cincinnati Bengals? Yeah, let's get right into the, the Bengals last year. The Bengals for a season were the bungles. They kind of stunk up the joint a bit. It only was because Joe Burrow was out for the season with a wrist injury. Didn't finish the rest of the season. This year, though, I'm going to say it. This may be Cincinnati's last dance. I think that the Bengals could be potentially either losing Chase or could be losing T. Higgins. They already lost Joe Mixon in free agency. They did get some good pickups. They did have an underratedly decent offseason in free agency. You bring in Mike Gesicki. You get Sheldon Rankins. You get Geno Stone, which I I think that's a, a huge boost for their secondary. They need somebody to help out in that back end of that secondary. Uh, I I think they made some good moves, but I think this is going to be the last year that we see this Bengals team be at this kind of level, because I think next year, next year, potentially they're going to have to scrap some of this roster and gut some of this roster and start all over again. Well, and it's not even like this roster as a whole is that great to begin with. I I think there are serious holes on, on this roster. And I, you think so? Yeah, I I do. I do. I really do. Um, Mm. I I think they have some pretty serious issues on defense that they did, did, did not address um, as well as on the offensive line. Um, According to ESPN's pass, uh, pass rate, rush, pass, rush, run, stop and pass block rankings as a team last year, the Bengals ranked 23rd in generating pressure from pass rush ranked 26th in stopping the run and ranked 27th in pass block win rate. This is not a team that is very good up front. The issue since this team got to a super bowl, however long ago was keeping Joe Burrow upright and it has failed to do so ever since they, they realized that was a problem when they first got to the super bowl. And then what they did in response is sign a bunch of 31, 32 year old guys who were falling apart uh, to try to salvage the the offensive line for, for Cincinnati. And that did not work. By the way, that's the same thing the New York Jets are doing. Um, so like we've seen that script before in, in New York. Um, if there are any Jets truthers hanging out here, like we've seen this in Cincinnati. It doesn't mm-hmm. work. Um, I said to some of my in-laws earlier this offseason 
we're going to look back on that Cincinnati Bengals Super Bowl run as probably the weirdest one off like aberration in the NFL. In I think that might have been the weirdest playoff run in the NFL for <laughs> yeah. both teams. Um, I, I think it's a really wacky thing. Now, that's not to say that I don't think Joe Burrow is quite good because I think he is quite good and can elevate this team. And what I love about this team, despite the fact that I think they have some serious issues up front on both sides of the ball, is that they have a really big advantage on the schedule favorability front because Joe Burrow was limited to start the season last year because of a calf injury he sustained on like the second day of training camp. That meant he was, he, he did not get, not get to participate in training camp basically whatsoever. He was limited in game action for like the first month of the season. And then after he broke his wrist, he did not play the final seven games of the season. Despite all of that, the Cincinnati Bengals fin finished nine and eight, which quite impressive for a roster that I think is kind of bad. Um, and nine and eight should be good enough to get you into the postseason most years, but you finished nine and eight and in last place of the first division in the NFL to have all four of its teams finish the season with a winning record in 70 years. So you get the advantage of being a nine and eight team. You're coming off of a winning season where you didn't have your starting quarterback and you get to play a fourth place schedule this year. It's so pretty they good. Come, yeah. Last year they played by like any metric, the most difficult schedule in the NFL, but by, by a good step now, because they're playing a fourth place schedule, they have the sixth most favorable strength of schedule by Vegas win totals coming into this year. Yeah. The other contender in your division, Baltimore, might have a better roster, but they are playing a first place schedule. And the Ravens have, by Vegas win totals, the fourth most difficult schedule in the league compared to Cincy's sixth most difficult. I think even though your roster in Cincinnati is flawed, you have a leg up on some of the other division contenders and maybe even conference contenders. You might be able to push your way through an easy schedule and get yourself that first round by even, I, I don't know that it's necessarily the case, but it gives you certainly gives you an advantage that some of the other contenders that ca came in from winning their division a year ago don't have. Yeah. And I, for the Bengals, this is perfect because it's kind of almost, it's kind of almost how say it's kind of almost replicated from what they had in 2021, you know, because remember the year before in 2020, they had one of the worst, they had the worst record in the National Football mm -hmm. League. And then they had a four, and then they had a first place, they had a fourth place schedule and they just coasted off that. Right. And this is why teams go from worst yeah, to first all the time. Yeah. So this is, this could almost reminiscent to what we could, what we could see from this team in from 2021 to this year. And yep. they've, and they've got it. I mean, they, they've, they've, They've got Joe Burrow. You got Jamar Chase still. If they can, you know, you got to hope that their offensive line is going to be able to hold Joe Burrow up for more than like two seconds. But like, God, it, 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 the Bengals, man, like this is, this is it for them. Like this is, this is, this is kind of their last shot to try and get this team into a deep postseason run because next year they're going to have to gut the team. You've got to figure out how you're going to pay Jamar Chase next year and T Higgins. If they try to pay T Higgins, you got to figure out how you're going to pay him. They're probably not, but I mean, some of that's too. coming together already. That's that's why you know you're th you're throwing the franchise tag around on receivers that aren't Jamar yeah. Chase. You're, you're planning on paying him. They're they're setting up this plan ahead of time. The the Joe Burrow contract looks you know, a, a little bit better every year, every off season that's going by as the cap goes up. It's not absurd to think that this team will continue to keep competing, but they, they need to figure out the, the offensive line. And if, I mean, we haven't seen any team ex we haven't seen any team except for a team quarterbacked by Patrick Mahomes pay the bag to a number one wide receiver and go on and win the Super Bowl. And yeah. I know that's like kind of unfair cherry picking because we haven't seen it many teams other than teams quarterback right. by Patrick Mahomes win Super Bowls lately. Um, but it, it, that's it, it, 
I have long been a skeptic of the pay the bag to the wide receiver mantra. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I agree with you. Like there hasn't been, and even with the highest paid quarterback too, there hasn't been, I think it's been a long, long time since the highest paid quarterback in the league is. I think that's a different question though, because it's that, that market resets year over yeah. year. Right. So like that, that, that title is pretty much always. That's and, and yeah, that's the other thing too. Like that market kind of resets itself. Yeah. So anyways, we go from one team in Ohio to another team in Ohio, the Cleveland Browns and Cleveland, the Browns, they were, they were a team last year. They were kind of the middle of the pack team. I mean, last year they, they didn't really impress, but they were one of those teams that just kind of pressed. Like they were, they were decent as in the words of Sam Jamini, I'm not overwhelmed. I'm just whelmed. And the Browns last year whelmed multiple teams last year and whelmed me. And now this year they come into the season, they add Jerry Judy, which I think for me, Kedrick is a big boost for this team. This wide receiving core kind of underratedly looks decent. I mean, Amari Cooper had a resurgent year last year. Okay. Jerry Judy, Jerry Judy, you bring him in. I think it's a fresh start for him, especially how it ended in Denver. Get him, you know, get him in a fresh, you know, a change of scenery, bring him to Denver or bring him to Cleveland and have him play in that offense. You have Elijah Moore. You have David Ajoku. They've got a, a decent wide receiving core. Uh, what is a big issue, though, for this Browns team is who's throwing him, who's throwing these guys the ball. And Deshaun Watson, like, for my hate in all this is just Deshaun Watson, dude. Like, that contract gets worse and worse and worse as, as, the the years go on because yeah, it's one of the rare terrible. TV contracts that continues to look worse. At, it looks even so despite bad, the, even despite the salary cap going up year over year. Right? And you don't have any basically job every either. basically every QB contract ends up being a bargain by the end of it. But the Deshaun Watson deal just looks worse all the time because oh. he fully guaranteed the whole thing. And yeah, that's my hate for uh, Cleveland as well because he had to get his shoulder basically reconstructed in the, in the off season or, or last season, whatever it was in November or what have you. And now he's sitting out days of training camp with just general arm soreness. Like brother, you're a starting quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. You're going to have to use your arm and throw a football from time to time. It is like, uh, like you're not, you're not a starting pitcher in the MLB. Like no. you, you don't get you. <laughs> This is not, uh, you already get in season the one week off, right? Like, oh, uh, it's, yeah, it looks bad for them, which sucks. Uh, fortunately, their, their, their defense is still good. This team was number two uh, by DVOA in the league last year and number two in the division because Baltimore was first. Mm -hmm. um, weirdly, though, they didn't have a great red zone defense by uh, touchdown conversion rate around middle of the pack, 17th in the league. So there's a chance that those two uh, numbers regress toward each other and we get a more like good, not great version of this uh, Cleveland defense. But that also comes along with a better red zone defense that will help it in those situations. So there's a, there's a chance that even if the defense comes back a little bit, it won't be as truly big of a step back because uh, of the the at least as big of a step back from a points on the board perspective because your red zone defense improves just a little bit. So uh, I think there's some hope for Cleveland there to maybe win through its defense despite its offensive struggles. Uh, Noah, tell me, who do you have winning the, the AFC North, the team in which all four finished with winning records a season ago? Oh, this is so tough. I mean... If we're choosing, like I'll, I'll even say this: who's going to be at the bottom? I think Pittsburgh will for sure. Yeah, be at the and like, of this what year. is the last time Pittsburgh finished last in a division? Because I, I think there's a real chance that actually happens here. This also, I think, will be the first year in the Mike Tomlin era that he will not have a winning season this year. Mark it down on this date: Mike Tomlin will not have a winning season this year. 
I just, I just don't think it's going to happen for Pittsburgh. Um, now who wins the division? It's, oh, oh my God. That's so, it's so tough. I, I want to go, I want to go with the Ravens. And I think I'm probably going to stick with the Ravens, but like, Cincinnati and Cleveland, man, they, they just, they, they're hanging like really close by a thread with the Ravens for that division title. I mean, every year, at least you see a split from one of those two teams. And I, I don't know that I'd call, I mean, if anything, I think Cincinnati finishes second. I think the Bengals finished second. Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd call Cleveland something close to being able to contend. Maybe in a world in which they steal a couple of games, but I I, I don't see that happening. I, I do think if you're just going to not be able to produce quarterback play, I think ultimately that's going to doom you. And in, in a world in which your defense is going to regress some, um, I, I think they're really not a, tr- a true contender for, for this division. Um, I'm going to take Cincinnati, actually. Uh, I, I like Baltimore's roster more, but I think that they're going to take some time to, to gel together a little bit, particularly with the moving pieces and young pieces on the offensive line, I think is going to take a little bit for them to get started. Uh, and you have to get started <laughs> against the Kansas city chiefs uh, on, on Thursday night football. So it's going to be a little bit harder and you have a hard, much harder schedule than, than Cincinnati does. So I'm actually going to take Cincinnati to win the division. And for the record, uh, the Steelers have never finished in fourth place in the AFC North. They have not finished in fourth place in a division since uh, 1988 when they finished fourth in the AFC Central. Oof. Or sorry, 1999 when they finished fourth in the AFC Central. It's going to happen. Uh, it's it's going to happen, uh, sadly. Uh, and I, I, I the other thing I think with the Browns, too, is you have the rating defensive player of the year in miles Garrett, Garrett on your yeah. roster to that. That's the, the re I, that's why I was leaning towards Cleveland maybe because solely their defense last year was incredible. I think it's you have miles Garrett. You still and, have Denzel Ward. Like that's not, that's not a bad defensive unit. Yeah. I, I just, you, you typically see like uh, defensive metrics just aren't as sticky as offense. So mm-hmm. for me to see a, a team in which, that defense might be on the field a lot if the offense can't do anything. It is hard for me to say this is going to be a top two defense in the league again. This is going to be a top five defense in the league again. And if it's not that, when I, I don't know what your offense is going to be, I have a really hard time predicting you being able to win a division in which I think you have at least one, maybe two actual Super Bowl contenders in it. Yeah, I, I, it's tough. But that that's going to be a fun division to watch throughout. Let's jump into the the black and blue division, and and this is probably going to be my favorite division to talk about, the NFC North, and we start with the 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 team that could potentially break out this year, mm. that will by all means shock a lot of people this year. I, I drafted Caleb Williams in fantasy this year. I drafted DeAndre Swift in fantasy. The Chicago Bears, man, Moving they on. they they <laughs> they have a plan and. They've got, they're moving in the right direction. They, for the last two seasons, had the most draft capital in the National Football League. They had the most cap space by far by any team in the National Football League. They also, with that, drafted Caleb Williams. They drafted, they got DJ Moore. They had multiple first round picks to to, to boot with that as well. They used those first round picks on Oh, I got to take a breather on Roman Dunes, and Caleb Williams. They like, I've talked a lot about the bears with Sam Jamini over the, over the last few episodes before Kedrick, you came on in the show. And he said the same thing to the bears. I mean, like he's never seen a team that, you know, is one draft away from being a playoff team. And the Chicago bears are on the doorstep of being that the one concern I do have is, is the defensive side. They didn't really add anybody Mm -mm. on the defensive side, which is very concerning. I mean, they didn't lose much either. No, they didn't. Largely the same set of contributors. They didn't, but, but still like 
there could be a massive drop in defensive production if they, if they don't see the same production that they saw last year. So on the defense. yes, and this is what I hate about the Bears as well because I think there's going to be significant turnover regression when we talk about defenses and defensive metrics not necessarily being sticky that is 100 true when it comes to generating turnovers some of uh, a good chunk of that is luck um when you take the number of passes defended per interception generated over the last three seasons of nfl play it also minds you that there is a a, a trend over the last like few decades that the interception rate in the NFL writ large has been dropping. So like, this is me taking a, a sample of the last three seasons in particular, because this number has continued to drop in the last three seasons, about one in five passes defended turns into an interception. It's a little bit more than every, every five passes defended turns into an interception last year. The Chicago Bears got that number down to 3.7 passes defended per interception. So basically, they had five or six more plays resulting in interceptions than we would expect by average. And you say, oh, what, five five or six more interceptions? Like, that's not, that's not a huge deal. But that's five interceptions out of the 22 that they had last year. That's over 22% of their interceptions generated. That's eight huge statistical anomaly. Um, I will note that the 49ers numbers were almost exactly the same last year for their defense. By the way, they had one more pass defended and uh, the same number of interceptions generated as the Chicago bears over the course of the season. But also like the bears, those interceptions came in a big chunk toward the end of the season as well. So like there was probably some, you know, really bad turnover luck at the beginning of the season where they weren't generating turnovers. And then they, over generated them above and beyond what their actual level of play would have um would have reasonably generated them over the course of an entire season in, in that back half of the season it's very strange while we're on the subject uh the packers had about half as many interceptions generated uh <laughs> according to their number of passes defended last year uh so there might be some regression up for uh the packers uh defense defensive unit but I think the for as exciting as the Bears defense was over the course of the back half of the season, I, I think there is reason to think that that unit is going to come back to the pack a little bit, even though it's sorry for the NFC North pun there, uh, <laughs> even though it did look really good in, in that tail end of the season. Yeah, uh, it 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 is going to be very interesting what the defense will do. And here's the other thing I, I will say, and this is the main point of why the bears, I think are going to be very good this year. The offensive side of the ball is way better, has gotten way better over the last couple seasons. They've kind of slowly, gradually improved it. It started with the offensive line. Mm -hmm. Now that's built from the, the skill positions. And now you've built it up to the quarterback position. And, this team, I think, offensively looks a lot better, too, in terms of coaching. They go from Luke Getze to Shane Waldron. Waldron did did wonders in Seattle with that offense. This is, I, I think, for, for people who want to, I'll say this early, in terms of offensive rookie of the year or rookie of the year predictions, Caleb Williams, I think, right now is... Oh, what the, the number highest. one overall pick is going to be your and it's your no and it's no for offensive rookie of the year and it's no hey, doubt with this no, roster. Wait a, wait a, whoa, watch <laughs> out there! What don't fall? I've broken I've broken your mind limb. twice. That, that limb right there. Oh man, don't break a leg walking out on that limb. <laughs> oh, I've broken your I've broken your mind twice today. But but uh, it, it's and and the reason why he's getting all these you know these high praises, he's got the most odds to win a rookie of the year offense rookie of the year is because his offense is just stacked around him this yeah. year. And that's a major, that's a major, major thing. He's good. The and the bears, the bears don't need him to be at like otherworldly this season. He, they need, they need him to be serviceable uh, this season, regardless of whether or not Caleb 
hits or not. The Bears actually have a plan in place to compete over the next few seasons. It's very clear. You mentioned at, at the top, they they are top 10 in, in cap space available to them, pro- projected over the course of the next two off seasons from now, right? This is a team that has cap space available for them to use it if they figure out that, like, yes, this is a window where we can compete. Caleb Williams is a guy who allows us to go out and compete, even when they're making free agent signings, like Keenan Allen, right? That has improved their offensive skill positions. You're signing Keenan Allen, but only giving him a one-year deal. You're not, you're not, like, you're not doing yourself a disservice over multiple seasons to go and get these guys. Even Matthew Judon, the trade that you were in on, uh, even though he ultimately went to Atlanta, you got this third-round pick that you could just go and hand out because you've had so many picks because you've got this haul from Carolina. So you can go and dangle this third round pick out, especially because Matthew Judon, as we come to find out, didn't necessarily need a new contract to play in a new city, right? So you were only giving out the third round pick just to get him, as opposed to in the past, when the past Bears regime dangled out premium picks. So in the middle of the season to trade for Montez Sweat so that you could go and give him a top of the market contract. You were trading away premium draft assets to then be able to sign at a premium for mm-hmm. talent. This team isn't doing stuff like that anymore. I hate to say it. I I, I hate to say it. The Chicago Bears know what they're doing. Yeah, and that, and that is something that I do not know if it has been true in my lifetime. It's yeah. It's it. It might really be happening. In, yeah. in Chicago, it might really be happening. I really wish Sam Jamini. I really wish Sam was on here to talk about this because he would have a lot of things to say with uh with you hyping the Bears up right now <laughs> on this talk. I'm sure he would probably tell me that like, no, I'm just a nerd and I'm wrong for saying <laughs> that the the turnovers are going to regress. Um, but, <laughs> no, I actually, I think I think Sam actually appreciates analysis like that. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I, I I think Bears fans genuinely have reason to be excited. Let's let's talk about another team that's been lost in the doldrums for a very long time in the NFC North, uh, and that that is the Detroit Lions. And um, I cannot believe they kept Ben Johnson. I can't believe they kept. It's ben a Johnson. steal, dude. And I know this was like eight months ago now, or whatever. It is not not that long. Seven months ago, whatever it was. But like, you kept the offensive coordinator that I, I really does make this team click. Uh, we we see year over year why these offensive coordinators make make the money they do these offensive coordinators get these head coaching jobs and do what they do because guys like sean mcveigh turn like baker mayfield into quarterbacks who are brought in off the street two days before playing in prime time to a guy who can lead the team to victory you you get guys like dave canales who can revive careers like Geno Smith. You can revive the career of Baker Mayfield and turn that into getting the head coaching job in North Carolina. Ben Johnson and the job that he has done as the offensive coordinator in Detroit is phenomenal. The fact that the Washington commanders could not get him to say yes to their head coaching job is hilarious. Too funny. Um, And Too is funny. A, a huge credit to... I guess his ability to recognize that he can have his choice of job basically when he is ready for it. And, and yeah, if the, if Detroit sucks this year for some strange reason that might not be available to him, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Noah, tell me about what you love about the Detroit lions this year. Uh, man, Detroit, like Ben Johnson is kind of a steal like that, that, that was so huge for Detroit that he could come back and this offense, I think it's a big boost just from coaching wise. Uh, defensively, however, they got a big boost in their secondary. I think they, I think they massively, massively, massively improved this yep. secondary from a year yep. ago. You look at last year, the, the, the Lions were one of the best teams in terms of run defense. They, they did not really give up too much in terms of rush yards at all on the defensive side. And, and Aaron Glenn, the defensive coordinator last year, said it. We want to be good at if we're not good at some areas, we want to be good at least at this one area. And it was rush defense. Now, the bad news about that, while you're good at rush defense, they were terrible at pass defense. They were 27th in pass defense. And their secondary, dude, was atrocious last year. Now, this year, they went out and, you know, they went out 
and they went into free agency. They get Carlton Davis. You go into the draft. You get Enos Rakestraw. You also get Terry and Arnold in the first round, which, by the way, was mm-hmm. a steal, a steal of a of a corner in the draft in the first round. Oh, and steal. That's like I mean, people in terms of I, I mean, in terms of the in terms of the 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 in terms of the NFL ready ability at the cornerback spot, he was the most NFL ready, but uh, you Maybe. pair, you, you pair him with Brian branch. And I think that the, like you got that and you had Brian branch from last year and that already, I mean, this secondary looks leaps and bounds better from where it was last year. And you don't have to worry about the pass rush. You already got that pass rush figured out this year though. It's going to be kind of this, it's going to be this secondary that I, I think is going to take that big jump. And this defense in terms of the pass defense, if they can just get to like middle of the pack, like 15, 16, mm. this is a very good lions defense. And this is a team that, you know, could be favored to win the NFC North in my opinion. Yeah. I, I certainly have my, reservations about the ability of young defensive backs to step into the league right away and succeed. I I certainly have my reservations there, but I know I can't totally talk out of both sides of my mouth on that one. When I'm talking the praises of Nate Wiggins in Baltimore and when I'm going to say the complimentary things that I'm going to say about the, the green Bay Packers new safeties. Um, So I really, I, I think that, the, the Detroit Lions did a good job of remaking their secondary in, into a unit that, you know, maybe isn't going to get uh, carved up like a Thanksgiving turkey uh, against the Green Bay Packers. Um, that's funny because that happened on Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, so I guess the only thing that I can really find on this roster that I hate is that you lost Jonah Jackson at guard. I think that's really the only thing that I, I truly hate about what, we see from the Detroit lions head, headed into this off season. Um, he is headed away from Jared Goff to go play for the LA Rams on their interior offensive line. And that's, that's certainly a loss, uh, but that's the only starter they lose on the offensive line. And otherwise I think they're going to be okay. Uh, Noah, do you have any hate in particular about the, Detroit Lions. You know, and this is just going to be me as a, as a, it's just a, a person. Like, this is, but no, like, uh, you are hosting a podcast with me. We embrace the hell out of haters. Come yes. on, let it out, man. Jared Goff, Jared, I just can't stand Jared Goff, dude. Like, yeah. That, that's, that's my biggest hate. Like, dude, Jared Goff, I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how, like, this is what, this is where Ben Johnson really makes his money. <laughs> is with is with Jared Goff, like because Jared Goff was absolute buns at the end of his tenure in the Rams, and I don't know how he got to be so incredibly amazing with the Lions, but it's been because of Ben Johnson. Now you take that away, I don't see Jared Goff being an NFL starting caliber quarterback. I, I just don't, and and I just think too he could be the big reason for why this Lions team could struggle this year if he has any, and I say this, any sort of regression, any sort of regression, I think this, I I think, you know, the Lions team struggles. And I I just, dude, I just can't, I just can't. Jared Goff, like, somehow has lasted longer as an NFL starting quarterback than Carson Wentz. And I just can't, I can't take that, dude. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know if it's by any amount of regression but like it's it's not as if Jared Goff was in in elite quarterback last season he was a borderline top 10 guy if you, if you chart him um by expected points added plus uh completion percentage over expected he was exactly number 10 in in the league last year uh during during the regular season so like he he's fine serviceable i am not totally convinced that a guy like that can can win a Super Bowl, but I don't know. I, every year that goes by, somebody gets closer and closer to proving me wrong, right? Brock Purdy brought the 49ers to overtime, right? Like I'm I'm closer and closer to being wrong on this every year. Um but we, we'll we'll see. Um let, let's 
let's talk about the the mess of a quarterback situation in Minnesota. Boo-hoo. Because yeah, they, they look that's a, that's a team that I Boo-hoo. I believe they could have competed for a wild card spot this year. And they have just been torn up by by injuries. And and that is that is my my hate for the Minnesota Vikings. You you, you get one look at your rookie quarterback, JJ McCarthy, and now he's out for the year. TJ Hawkinson is out for the first half of the season. Jordan Addison looks like he's going to miss part of uh, the season at the very beginning here, maybe a week or two with uh, a rough ankle sprain. They, they got, they got problems. You're, you're what backup tight end is the, the ghost of big Bob Tunyon. Um, that's rough. Woof. This, this is a Minnesota Vikings team that has hit the injury bug hard early on. Uh, that's, that's too bad for them. Um, Noah, do you have a love or hate uh, for the Minnesota Vikings? Oh, boy. Love and hate. I mean, to start with hate, I mean, it's the same thing as you. Like, they they lost almost their – they lost a lot of their production due to injury this year. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, and it's brutal to say that. I mean, like, you, you don't have Jordan Addison potentially. You don't have TJ Hawkinson. You lose J.J. McCarthy, so you don't have – now a quarterback right now at the moment that you could go to for the start of this season. And I mean, dude, it's, it's rough for Minnesota and, and Kevin O'Connell better be praying every night after every game that he plays this year, because good Lord, that team, I said this even too, that team is going to be hot buns this year. And the only good thing about the the Vikings is they're going to probably be in the top five for the draft by the time this season ends. The good news is, though, and th- t- take it with a grain of salt if you want to call this good news. They did, you know, put duct tape on some spots that were needed. Running back, I think, was a need that they had to, to go out and fill. They filled it with Aaron Jones, uh, quarterback. Y- you have Sam Darnold on your team now as quarterback. You fill that. At least he's going to be there for a year. So that's one spot. You look at the defensive side, they they brought in Jonathan Grenard to help out with that pass rush because you lose Daniil Hunter. They there there's just a there's just a couple spots where they that were much needed and they did kind of patch those holes up a bit, but other than that like man this team, this team is going to suck. I'm sorry. Yeah, like they suck. they they attempted to get players that better fit the Brian Flores defensive scheme, which I, I think is good for them. It's probably what I like the most about what they did this offseason. Um, last year, the Vikings led the league in plays where they rushed six or more players. Despite that, they ranked 21st overall in plays that generated quarterback pressure. So they tried to generate the most pressure in the league, basically, and generated the 21st most pressure in the league. So you bring in some edge rushers who can help you there. You bring in Andy Van Ginkle for, uh, from Miami, and you bring in Jonathan Grenard from Houston. And that's that's going to give you an actual pair of pass rushers, and you'll hopefully be able to make make something out of that because you can't be much worse. Given how much you did try to rush the passer last year, you can be much worse at rushing the passer than you actually were. Uh, so I, I think it's tough. I think Minnesota's going to finish last in this division. And that's tough for a team that I think was really hoping it could be a playoff team a month ago. Yeah, it's kind of shattering. And and now, like, they're going to be sitting last. I, boy, Kevin O'Connell, Kevin O'Connell's better be, you know, every night before he goes to bed on a Saturday night, just be like, Lord, I pray that today that we don't suck. Yeah. And, and that's the Minnesota Vikings. All right. Let's go to our, our favorite team here on this wonderful show that is Snap the Pigskin. It is time. Yes. The Green Bay Packers, man. I have I have been waiting. I have been salivating at the mouth to get to this, you know. Uh, Green Bay last season was Utah I, under the radar team, but they kind of had a breakout year with a breakout player, Mr. Jordan Love. Got the got the Packers all the way to the postseason. Got his first playoff win over the Cowboys. Kedrick, you were there to witness that. That was I was, and it was moment. awesome. It was an incredible <laughs> moment. 
<laughs> there is nothing and, better. That, maybe maybe trolling the heck out of Bears fans, but there's almost nothing better than trolling the hell out of Cowboys. Oh, fans. absolutely. Especially when they're your in loss. That absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Eileen's not right next to you. When you say that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. She was there wearing Packer gear. She's I I, I got I got that for me. <laughs> uh, but they lost to the 49ers. This has been an issue that I'll ask you when we get into this, you know, mm. with the with the Packers and the 49ers, but they kind of they improved their roster in the draft, especially mm-hmm. the safety core. When we were there at Packers mm-hmm. camp, night and day, they mm-hmm. upgraded their safety core. Xavier McKinney they added in the safety mm-hmm. group. You also look as well, they added Josh Jacobs in the running back core, and they went out in the draft. They get Jordan Morgan in the first round, Edrin Cooper in the second, and Marshawn Lloyd in the third. They filled all three of their needs, linebacker, tackle, and running back. They got this incredible wide receiving core with Wicks, Reed, Dobbs, Watson. You have in the tight ends group, Tucker Kraft, Luke Musgrave. The Bears offense, I think, will be one of the best in the NFL, but it's not compared to what the Packers have on the offensive side with this group. And I know you're giving me that look, but I don't know that I'm going Bears, what top five offense. Let's chill. Top out top there. ten either. You don't think they're okay. Well, that's like I'm not reasonable, but you go to one of the best offenses in the NFL, the Chicago Bears. Re- like, regardless, let's, let's chill. Okay, best offense in the division. The Packers probably will have the best offense in this division, but mm, then we're Detroit. Yeah. But I, I which is what I, I say for my love, my hate on this is the defense. They, you know, you lose Joe Barry. You thank God that man is. <laughs> booted to Timbuktu <laughs> and they bring in Jeff Halfley who knows what's going to happen there. It, it is kind of that concern with the defensive side that I have every year, but I want to start by saying this before we get into love and hate. When at some point do the Packers get over this hump of losing to the San Francisco 49ers in the postseason? Cause it, it, it happens Almost on a regular on a regular basis now in the postseason. It happens to literally every other team in the NFC too. I I I don't think that we necessarily need to paint this as a Green Bay Packers thing, uh, especially because I I think Matt Lafleur has a winning record over Kyle Shanahan in the regular season too, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I I I might be wrong about that, but I know that their record in in the regular season is actually much closer than it is. I think it's three. I think it's three and three. Yeah. I, I, wh- whatever it is. It's obviously closer than uh, <laughs> getting goose egged in, in the, in the postseason. Um, look, the 49ers have been a good team. The whole NFC has been trying to figure out how to catch them over the last several years. The way the playoff bracket has fallen, and because you it's single elimination and you only have six or seven teams in each conference, it just so happens the Packers have played them several times. That's really not that weird from like a a numbers perspective. For oh, trying to make it trying to stop making it make sense. (laughs) I I mean, it's the same thing that we do though. We do the same thing on the AFC side though, and talk about how uh, Josh Allen can't get past uh, Patrick Mahomes. Right? It just so happens that they are both like they're both good and both get there we don't say the same thing about uh we, we kind of say the same thing about lamar jackson but not as much because he just they he, they just don't happen to play each other in the postseason all the time like it happens with mahomes and allen I, I i don't know it just is the case uh it just kind of is what it is uh i i will go and give give my love and hate here which is Loving that the Packers have an absolute embarrassment of riches at wide receiver. Mm-hmm. It is stupid. It, it is just stupid. The more <laughs> I think about it, the more it's dumb. And you could make the same argument on the defensive line, uh, perhaps too, with it's stacked with, Col- with Colby Wooden, with Carl Brooks, with Lucas Van Ness. Who look, Lucas Van Ness needs needs some work from a polished technique standpoint, but they'll figure that out. They figure that out with Rashawn Gary, who's also there, with Kenny Clark, who's also there. You still have Preston Smith, who is not quite a skeleton yet, but still have Preston <laughs> Smith. Um, they, they have. There's there's so much they can do from the Devontae team. Wyatt too, uh, as well. which, which is good. Yeah, yeah, I. I Again, an embarrassment of riches on the defensive line, but also at wide receiver. And I am sick and tired of hearing people say that the Green Bay Packers need a number one wide receiver. They have no number one. They need a number one. Shut the heck up. 
leave this one to the nerds because on this one, the nerds actually know ball more than you do. Grant freaking DeBose, which is a name that you have never heard of because yes, he was man. on the Green Bay Packers practice squad last year, right? Might take the place of Bo Melton on this roster who had a 100 yard game and pants the Vikings on national TV for everyone to witness at their new year's Eve party. <laughs> of course. Right. Samori Ture is not going to make the roster. Um, that's, I think that's pretty determined. Malik yeah. Heath, who was supposed to be the diamond in the rough on this roster last season, who got five passing snaps on Thanksgiving last year against Detroit caught four balls for 46 yards on those five snaps. He was supposed to be the diamond in the rough last year. Plus, you have Christian Watson, and you have Romeo Dubs, and you have Dontavian Wicks, who plenty of people also think might be the number one wide receiver, who is like the the who is has the route running ability that overshadows everybody. Christian Watson has the athleticism that overshadows everybody, but Romeo Dubs seems to have the connection with Jordan Love that overshadows everybody. Oh, and we didn't even talk about Jaden Reed, who actually led this team in receiving last year. Mm -hmm. This is an embarrassment of gaudy levels of wealth for fast catchers. And I didn't even mention Luke Musgrave or Tucker Kraft. It's absurd. And they're not going to be able to keep everybody. They kept seven receivers in, as recently as 2022. So maybe they keep a bunch. They kept eight in 2018 on the 53. I don't think they're going to do it because I think they need more bodies at defensive back to like just be able to swap guys out when some of the defensive backs ultimately suck. But Noah, this is an embarrassment of riches at wide receiver. It's it's amazing. Am I, am I over the top? Am I over the top? Like, you're not. It's actually you're, crazy. You're like spot you're, on. There, when you go name searching for some of these guys on Twitter, right? Like you find fans of other teams begging for their teams to pick up guys like Malik Heath mm -hmm. if they get cut. That's nuts that we're talking about guys that are going to get cut and people being like, no, he would be a top three wide receiver on the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> And what's what's crazy too is Grant Debose last year was part of that Dontavian Wicks Jaden Reed draft, mm -hmm. and he didn't even get to play last year because he was hurt most of camp. And the one thing yeah, I'd love he, he got injured right away. Yeah, he got injured right away at camp, so he never really got a chance to play. And yep. I even said too in the draft process, like he if he gets a chance to show out, like dude, he's gonna be a stud. Yeah, and this year, like he's making up for it in camp and and he then looks awesome in camp he looks awesome in preseason oh like, my god and then you have bo melton and malik heath and somehow samari torre still on that roster taking up a roster spot he's, not, he's like, just he's just there to be a camp body like yeah. it doesn't matter maybe, but, maybe he'll stay on the practice squad but, but like, he's, he's not gonna be on this team I, I don't think he's really relevant to this conversation but my god like this team is good like the, on the offensive side but I, i'm curious what what is your hate i you talked you got very over the top about the offense. I feel like there, there has to be a hate. So Packers team. I do have offensive line depth question marks. Uh, this is not, this is not my hate, but I do want to mention it. Uh, I, every team in the league has offensive line depth question marks. Um, but which is surprising I, for the Packers. I'll say it that much. Yeah. I mean, it's just that they, they had starting caliber guys on this team a year ago who, aren't here because they're starting for other teams now. Right. Um, but if Zach Tom is not ready to go week one, this is going to be hard for this team to figure out who, who is going to start at right tackle uh, because I, Rashid Walker is awesome. He, he's seventh round pick and he's a starting left tackle in the NFL. hundred um, percent. I, I think you have to say if Zach Tom isn't able to play, you're going to kick Jordan Morgan out to tackle and not play him at right guard. And then you slide in uh, maybe Jacob Monk to play uh, on the interior of the line. He's gotten good snaps. Maybe Sean I, Ryan. Do you put I, Sean I, Ryan or, there? Or Sean Ryan. It's one, it's one of the two. Uh, yeah. um, and I've been encouraged by seeing them during, during camp and during the preseason. But I think there's, there's definitely questions. Uh, on the edges for, for the offensive line. I think they have enough interior depth to where they can, they can withstand injuries, but they definitely have questions about tackle depth, which could be an Achilles heel for this team. 
but I think the bigger issue is that they don't do not have the linebacker position figured out. Yeah, uh, I, I have questions about the cornerback position too. Um, but I think the linebacker position, the inside linebacker position is the huge weakness for this team in Jeff Halfley, Halfley's scheme, because a lot of Jeff Halfley's scheme is about letting your defensive black backs play press coverage while your defensive line tries to wreak havoc up front. That leaves your linebackers over the middle of the field to try to play a lot of zone coverage and make sure that they make tackles so that um, a, a medium play does not turn into a chunk play. Um, so you have Quay Walker over the middle who has not proven himself to be a, a disciplined enough linebacker to play, uh, in coverage in the national football league. Mm -hmm. You also drafted a hyper athletic type in Edger and Cooper who looks a lot like your draft pick of Quay Walker to play next to Quay Walker in this scheme. When you have questions about the Quay Walker type. Edge, Edge Cooper's best trait is, is just getting after the quarterback. That's not what you need these linebackers to be doing all the time right now, uh, unless you're going to feel really confident about being like, all right, we have other guys in the defensive line that will back up into playing some level of coverage, like, like Preston Smith playing in the flat, whatever. Um, but in addition to Edge Cooper, like he's also hurt. So that leaves you with Isaiah McDuffie, who I think is serviceable. But then beyond that, it's what Tyron Hopper, who I, I, I don't think anybody really likes as a draft pick from, from this year. I certainly need to see it in game action before I remove the giant question mark that I have over uh, uh, Tyron Hopper's head. Linebacker is where I have my biggest questions. Th look, this defense was not good last year. Uh, and a, a, a defensive coordinator change on its own isn't going to fix that. I think there should be some regression up for a defense that was really bad last year has to come up a little bit, right? Because defense isn't that sticky. You, you generated fewer turnovers than your actual numbers like passes defended should indicate that you would have turned over, but they did have some fumble luck on the offensive side of the ball too, where they recovered a lot more fumbles than you would have expected them um, to recover of, of their own fumbles. So like, I definitely got questions on the defensive side of the ball. I think the biggest one is that linebacker, but like I, I, I still got questions about the secondary too. I don't know. Noah, Noah, what do you, what do you think? What was your hate for the green backers this season? So like, Oh, the hate it goes towards the defense. I mean, like, you know, you go from Joe Barry to Jeff Halfley. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's going to be a big improvement from last year to, you know, if it's going to be a big improvement this year from last year. But I also think too, you look at it. I mean, Goody, like Goody knows what he's doing and, and Goody knows what to do in this, in, in, in the draft and in free agency, Adrian Cooper, best inside linebacker of the, of the draft last year. I think in my, in my opinion was one of the best inside linebackers of this draft. Uh, Quay Walker, you know, is a little bit more of a bigger linebacker and more you can put down as an edge rusher to kind of get after the quarterback and try and get home. And then Isaiah McDuffie and Tyron Hopper and Eric Wilson are your other ones. And I, it's just, man, it's just so, I, I do think linebacker is a concern, but I, I do think O-line is also a big concern. It's just for me overall, the defense and just where, yeah. what is this team going to look like well, under Halfley, because he hasn't played, he hasn't been in the NFL in a long, long time. So, yeah. and then if, if you move beyond linebacker, like let's look at the cor corners, right? You have Jair Alexander, who you you should be excited about, right? Who was at some point in time, I think, pretty definitively the number one corner in the NFL, but he's played an average of nine games over the past three seasons. On the opposite boundary, you have Eric Stokes who has barely played meaningful football either of the past two seasons. Are they going to keep Keyshawn Nixon in the nickel? Even, even though I think it is somewhat apparent that Javon Bullard is your better option at nickel, that your, your, your draft pick out of Georgia. I think you're lucky that it looks like Evan Williams uh, looks really dang good at, at safety playing next to Xavier McKinney. And so al although they are, young and so I, I i have to you know give those question marks a little bit i think at safety they're probably going to be okay 
it's corner in the secondary where I have more questions because Jair could go down and get hurt. Eric Stokes could go down and get hurt. And then you're left like with the Allentines of the world. And that's not a great place to be. Uh, and I don't want Keyshawn Nixon playing, playing on the boundary either. It's yeah. Yeah. The, the defense, I, I definitely have questions here and maybe, maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe a scheme ch- change fixes things when you're going to feel more free to go out and just try to get after quarterbacks and be stout up front because you I have mean, weapons to do that. If you, if you're going to just play through your front five, six, awesome. Let's do it. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it could be, it, that's what it could be too, is potentially you just needed a scheme change. I mean, they've been three, four, they've been a, a 34 defense the last few seasons and it hasn't worked. Mm-hmm. So now switching from that to a multiple D could potentially, Which, yeah, could potentially I, I, help. I, I think it's huge considering the personnel advantage you have playing, playing a four, three defense, just with the number of guys you have on the D line, like I talked about at the beginning, like you're, you're spot on there Noah, where yeah. that switch to four, three could, could be huge just because you have a personnel advantage to play that, to play that scheme better. Yeah. So it, well, it, I'm, that's all I got for my defense, but uh, now let's get to it. The black and blue division. Who do you think is going to win the NFC North? It's going to come down to, I think the Lions and the Packers for this division. I think the Bears, they're they're a year off from competing for a division title. I think they'll make the wild card, but the Lions and the the Packers are the only two teams that I think could compete for this division title. Who you got, Kendrick? Um, and if I, you go Packers, I say you're a homer. No, I, I have Detroit, um, and I have Detroit pretty firmly. I think the more I sit with this Packers team this offseason, and I don't know if this is just me being like anxious fan, um, the more I sit with this Packers team this season, the less certain I feel about it. Um, I feel really good about Detroit. Um, and, and let me give you a weird quirk uh, for the Chicago Bears schedule. The Chicago Bears do not play a divisional opponent until they host the Green Bay Packers on November 17th. Mm-hmm. They don't, they don't post a, they don't play a single divisional game until November 17th, which means that in the last eight weeks of the season, they play six divisional games. That looks a little bit less daunting now that you have the Vikings twice, which are hobbled, but like in those final six, in those final eight games of the season, you play your six divisional games and you have to play at San Francisco. (laughs) So like you gotta, if the bears want to make the playoffs, they got to stack wins early. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, I I have, I have Detroit winning the NFC North. Uh, I I just think they're, I think they're more complete than the Packers right now. I, I have fewer question marks about them over overall. That, that was a defense that finished, uh, fifth in offensive DVOA last season and 19th in defensive DVOA last season. And I think it's probably a little bit better on the defensive side. Well, the Packers finished sixth in offensive DVOA. They finished 31st in, in defense. And I don't think you're going to regress all the way up to being, I mean, maybe you regress up to being a top half defense, but I don't think you're going to regress up to being a top 10 defense, which uh, Detroit might be able to do this season. Uh, certainly has a better shot at it than, than Green Bay does. Yeah, I, it, I, I think between these two teams, Detroit and Green Bay, it is very interesting. I, I want to give the Packers a lot of credit. I want to give them this division title because they have. it's been like – they've been kind of on a drought, surprisingly. If you could say three years is kind of a drought, it surprises. Uh, but I got to give I, – I, I got to go with Detroit as well. I, I think Detroit is so much more – I think Detroit, you look at them, they're, they're a much more complete team in this division and they're ready to win now. And yeah. Green Bay, they're they're so close to kind of getting back to where they were in this division and, and just dominating the, the daylights out of teams. I just, I, I think Detroit, this is kind of their year. This is kind of their team. And the Lions, to me, I, I think will win this division and they'll win it very closely you know, in the, in the NFC North in the black and blue division. All right. As we still All right. Call it. So. Noah, I have my predictions already written down on this note card. So give me your division, your, your eight division winners. Give me your total of six wild cards. Give me your Super Bowl matchup. 
end winner now that we are here at, oh, at the tail end god eight division winners oh man so or do we have do we have a spare week before we do have a we do have a spare week because we're, okay, we're well right. over time i will give you i will give you until our spare week just before the regular season starts to decide on your 14 playoff teams your super bowl matchup and winner um but i already i already have mine I am yeah. I am locked in, and so <laughs> that I will keep these on our respective note cards to determine uh, who who did who did it goodest. Who did, did it goodest? Year. Yes, that is the the official competition. Oh, that's perfect, and, and we'll probably do it next week. But I do want get- I I do want to get in just one second before before we move on. The the Bears. We talk about them needing to make the playoffs and, and what that looks like. It, it at the beginning of the season they played the Titans. Texans, Colts, Rams, then Panthers, Jags, Commanders, Cardinals, Patriots. They got stack wins in that Panthers, Jags, Commanders, Cardinals, Patriots run because mm-hmm. right after that is when you hit your your last eight weeks of Gauntlet. the season where you where you play the Lions twice, the Packers twice, and you play the 49ers. So you you got to win probably all of those games from October sixth to November tenth. Yeah, you got to stack them, and you got to stack them pretty early in it. And I just they they can do it, but man, it's going to be hard to do, especially with that second half being so brutal. Yeah. So, All right, let's get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, we're done here today. And if you want to watch me and Kendrick more and and, and listen to more of our, our show. Yes, no. I tell tell the good people where to find you yes. and all the things that you do these days. Yes, you can find me on uh, on on the app formerly known as Twitter at Rigo Clark, and you can also uh, find us here. It's at, at Clark Rigo. Clark this is Rigo. the second time we've been on a podcast and I've corrected you about your own Twitter handle twice. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, you can find me at, at Clark Rigo on the app formerly known as Twitter. Also too, if you want to watch more episodes of us and snap the pigskin as well, give us there. You can follow uh, Kedrick Stumbrus at, at Scotty six pack. Is it, or is mm-hmm. it Kedrick Stumbrus? Yeah. At Scotty six pack or at Kedrick Stumbrus. Oh. And then also feel free to watch Snap the Pigskin at www.youtube.com slash Snap the Pigskin or listen wherever you get your podcast. So with that, that was a long episode and hopefully we will be back once again. But for that, that does it for us here on another edition of Snap the Pigskin.